Please be seated and good morning. The events described in this morning's gospel passage from John chapter 20, from which Deacon Bud just read, took place over an eight-day span of time that began on the evening of the Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead and culminated on the following Sunday evening. And as we look at a composite of the various gospel accounts of the events of the day of Jesus' resurrection, we know that by now, on the evening of Resurrection Day, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Peter and John have all seen the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene has actually seen and spoken to Jesus himself and has told the disciples about that interaction. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus have also seen Jesus, and they've hurried back to Jerusalem to tell the others about their encounter with the Lord. So it is now Resurrection Sunday evening, and the disciples are gathered behind closed and locked doors, probably filled with a strange mixture of confusion and hope, coupled with fear that it is only a question of time before those who kill Jesus will come for them. Although Jesus had already risen, and they already had evidence of that fact, as yet they were still living on the wrong side of the resurrection. But then suddenly, in spite of the closed doors, John tells us, Jesus came and stood right in the middle of the gathering. Without warning, without announcement, without fanfare, boom. Jesus is there. And notice the very first thing that he says as they stood there, probably with their jaws on the floor, is, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Not, behold, I have risen as I said. Not, why did you ever doubt that I could and would do what I said I would do? Neither of those things, but peace be with you. Why peace? Well, because Jesus knew that at that moment, their hearts lacked peace for two reasons. First, they were fearful of the Jewish religious leaders. And secondly, they were no doubt ashamed of the fact that they had deserted and denied him at the hour of his greatest need. In Colossians chapter 1, we read these words from St. Paul, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That peace that Jesus extended to his apostles on that resurrection Sunday evening was the peace that he had just won for them and for us three days earlier on the cross. From this day forward and forever, that word peace would take on a whole new meaning for Christians. Peace, not merely the absence of conflict, but now the essential element of a whole new life, a whole new way of living. Living at peace with God, living at peace in his kingdom, living at peace with each other. St. Paul in Philippians 4, 7 says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Today is Divine Mercy Sunday, the Sunday dedicated to acknowledging with thankfulness the peace that we have in our hearts because the mercy of God has been showered upon us human beings in and through the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's appropriate on this Divine Mercy Sunday that we take a few moments simply to contemplate and reflect on the very meaning of mercy, this attribute of God that lies at the very core and the essence of our salvation and of the Easter message. I want to say something at the outset and want to ask you to think, to really think about this. Mercy, mercy is the single most crucial attitude that Almighty God has toward you and me. Let me say it again. 
Mercy is the single most crucial attitude that Almighty God has toward you and me. Think about it. Without the mercy of God, you and I would be toast. Literally, toast. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, St. Paul says that, speaks of the God who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy because God is love. Love is mercy's foundation, and forgiveness is mercy's expression. On the very evening of his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the apostles, as we just read, and gave them the power and authority to forgive sins, an authority that has been passed on generation to generation through apostolic succession for the past 2,000 years to every Catholic priest in the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which, by the way, is the greatest tangible expression we have of God's mercy in the world today, the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And have you noticed how many times in the Mass we mention mercy, usually asking for God's mercy? When we do that, what we're really doing is making a statement about sin, both the nature of sin and the peril that ongoing unrepented sin represents in our lives. 1 John 1, 8 says this, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, I think you understand that there is a real danger in our too easily dismissing the sin in our lives, in rationalizing it, and coming up with extenuating circumstances that in our minds acquit us of our sinfulness. It's a common pitfall among many Christians, and especially many Catholics, and one that partially explains why relatively few Catholics today avail themselves of the sacrament of reconciliation on a regular basis. And it is, as I said, dangerous because it thoroughly disregards the reality in most of our lives. What is that reality? That reality is this. We sin. We sin continually. Sometimes we sin grievously. In spite of our redemption, in spite of our relationship with God in Christ, in spite of our understanding of what pleases God and what displeases Him, in spite of our best intentions, you and I sin on a regular basis and thus desperately need God's mercy anew on a regular basis. The forgiveness of sin that we experienced in baptism or in the confession that we made one or 10 or 30 years ago isn't the end of the story. It's only begin the beginning. First John 1 John chapter 1 goes on to say this in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need the mercy of God in our lives continually because, as I said, we sin continuously and sometimes grievously. And I would suggest to you that the more grievously one has sinned and then experienced the sweet mercy of God bringing healing and deliverance and reconciliation and, yes, peace, the more that one is compelled to truly appreciate and cherish that mercy. Jesus himself said that of the woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee, the one who washed the Lord's feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. He said that the, that the one who has been forgiven much loves much. It's true. The mercy of God applied to sin inspires and arouses a deeper and deeper love of God. And the greater the mercy, the greater and more extravagant the love it impels us to have for God. That's so because of what mercy is at its very core. What is it? In his encyclical on the mercy of God, entitled Dives in Misericordia, Rich in Mercy, St. John Paul II, who fittingly, by the way, 
you'll remember, passed away from this life into the glory of God on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday in 2005, John Paul defined mercy as love coping with evil. Love coping with evil. Jesus himself is the perfect example of the mercy of God incarnate. And isn't love coping with evil exactly what God did in sending Jesus, his only begotten son, to die for us while we were still sinners? And if mercy is love coping with evil, isn't that what Jesus modeled perfectly when from the cross he prayed for his tormentors, he prayed for his executioners with the words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mercy is love coping with evil. Mercy is love that loves when it has not been loved. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus also taught us a powerful lesson about the mercy of God in the parable of the prodigal son, where that son, in spite of his father's love for him, and in fact in violation of that love, takes his inheritance and rushes headlong into a downward spiral of evil living. When he finally comes to his senses and he decides to return home and ask his father's forgiveness, the father, for his part, demonstrates what true mercy is. He is faithful to his fatherhood, faithful to his love for his son. He is eagerly waiting for the young man to return to him. He immediately and generously receives him back and rejoices because his son has come home. When we, in the midst of our sin, ask God for mercy, especially in the sacrament of reconciliation, that is what God is prepared to do for us every single time. That's why the Apostle Paul calls him the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. If you think about it, the absolution by the priest in the sacrament of reconciliation begins with the words, God, the Father of mercies. We read in the Song of Solomon that love, mercy's foundation, is more powerful than death. Christ's resurrection is proof of that, just as his, cru uh, his, re just as his crucifixion is proof that good is more powerful than evil. And mercy is proof, proof positive that love does not allow itself to be conquered by evil, but overcomes evil with good, as St. Paul teaches in Romans chapter 12. Jesus' redemptive act of suffering, dying, and rising all on our behalf is the revelation of mercy in its absolutely fullest expression. And we need that mercy poured out in our lives every day. We need to ask God humbly for his mercy every day. The more that I can grasp the role that, mer that the mercy of God has played and continues to play in my life, the more I will love God. And thus, the more I will desire the continual flow of his mercy in my life and the more I will assertively but humbly order my life around the understanding that God in his mercy has been so good to me in forgiving my sins, in restoring me to his friendship, in pouring his abundant grace into my life, none of which, by the way, I deserved. None of it. Heaven forbid that God should ever begin to deal with us according to what we deserve. Amen? Amen. Lord, have mercy. But there's one more thing that cries out for me to do. When I come to the understanding of what God's mercy has done for me, that one thing is to go and to do likewise. God, help us if we don't. God, help us if we take on the role of the unforgiving servant in the parable of Matthew 18. The master calls that servant wicked, 
specifically for not having mercy on his fellow servant as his master had had on him. It is not for nothing that Jesus in the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not for nothing that he declares in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. mercy. It is not for nothing that he says in Luke 6.36, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And then there's this chilling declaration from St. James in his epistle, chapter 2, verse 13. James says this, Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Brothers and sisters, the one thing that can undermine and negate the mercy of God in our lives is our failure to show mercy to others. It is a fundamental demand of the gospel that we who have been so lavishly blessed with the mercy of God show mercy to others, especially to those who have wronged us. We should be proactively looking for ways in which we can be agents of mercy to others as a simple but natural response to the effect of God's mercy in our own lives. We come to this humble realization that the Father of mercies has graciously imparting, imparted his mercy to us, undeserving as we are. We should then reflexively ask, what can I give God in return for this unfathomable gift? And we should never get to the point of contentedly thinking we have given enough. After all, think about it. What is your soul worth? What is your soul worth? What was it worth to Jesus? He gave his all so that you and I could walk in God's mercy and the forgiveness of our sins, so that you and I could grow in grace and in the image of Christ, so that you and I would be not only the recipients of God's mercy, but the agents of it as well. Because the measure we have grown in mercy is the measure we have grown at all. The measure we have grown in mercy is the measure we have grown at all. And so, brothers and sisters, on this Divine Mercy Sunday, I encourage you to reflect and take stock of the role of God's mercy in your life, the extent to which God has lavished his mercy on your life, and then go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.